This is the official podcast of the man behind R.D. Sinto, Inc., real estate maven, visionary, community man, Bob Sinto. Each episode of the Let Me Be Your Landlord show will feature lessons learned through experience, all delivered with the humor, wisdom, and the straightforward nature that our host is known for. I'm John Iannuzzi, and Park City Productions is proud to present this podcast before he became a leader in Connecticut corporate real estate with close to 4.5 million square feet, 50-plus buildings, and an occupancy rate of nearly 98%, which is well above national averages. The Sinto story started in the Park City with a family-run plumbing business. What takes place over the course of the next six decades is what we will focus on here on this program. You know, I'm pleased to say, first off, that the interest in this podcast in this program has not waned. And I have a couple of comments from subscribers that I wanted to read to you. All right. First off, I love the concept. This, this young lady said, I love the concept of empathy learned through personal experiences. Mm-hmm. The next one said, I can't believe he went into Father Panic Village at 11 <laughs> o'clock at night. I used to live there from 63 to 74. <laughs> and then third, great insights, always engaging. I was on a cable show on Soundview TV okay. in Stratford, and I was doing a program on the mortgage crisis, and generically, the conversation somehow turned into the Let Me Be Your Landlord podcast, and this host of the show was blown away that you said you remember every name yeah. okay, of all the folks that you have on your boat when you go out on the outing. I think it was 14 people right, at, a, at right. a time. And I just thought to myself that it's really that difference, okay, that distinction between being a name on the side of a building mm-hmm. that people see every day versus being a true member of the community. Mm-hmm. And that is a difference that you can't pay for or buy. And, um, you know, in episode two, we discussed three important principles, service, imagination, compassion. Mm-hmm. And with regards to imagination, you talked about that photo book, The Family of Man, Mm -hmm. and you described how important it was to you. I did some research. It's on Amazon. Okay. You can purchase it. I know. Uh, And it was described as a groundbreaking humanist classic from the 1955 show at MoMA. That's right. And it was hailed as one of the most successful photography exhibitions of all time. You told us about that last week. And... It's now in its 30th printing. What was it about that looking through the camera lens? What is it that the camera lens allowed you to be able to bridge that gap and feel that compassion? Well, if you look at the book, I mean, there's one picture of a mother during the Great Depression. There's a very famous photograph, and she has three or four children hanging on to her. And, and and the despair in this poor lady's face and the way the kids were hanging on to her when one was a very little baby that she was holding, you know, you just felt for her, you know, and felt for the people. I like to tell people, a great photographer, you recognize who took a picture who's a great photographer because he has the ability to understand the human condition of the person he's photographing and he does that consistently that's the secret i mean that when i was look when i had the camera and i was trying to photograph i was trying to to get into their skin to see how they were really thinking and feeling when i can get the perfect shot i got pretty good at it be honest with you, you do you know? still take pictures oh uh, no my wife is very you know, pissed at that because I used to take so many pictures. And in my in my office, you can see the pictures of all my kids. I mean, I took thousands of pictures of my kids. And, of course, the only thing I take pictures of was my dogs. <laughs> I, I have a lot of pictures of my dogs, as I can tell you. I just, again, I thought it was such an interesting concept that just having that extra layer between you and the subject allowed for so much creativity. Well, like I told you, I'm trying to make up for the fact that I couldn't read. So I, I try to develop better visual skills, you know, and, and that, you know, was very helpful. 
I thought it would be interesting for people if, if, if you're on YouTube or on Apple right now, if you look down, I put a link where you could buy this book. Okay, terrific. That's wonderful. Um, in our previous conversations, maybe unintentionally, you seem to repeatedly go back to your Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. How big of a role does your faith play in your business? Well, I think it's life? tremendously important, but, but it doesn't have to be Catholic. It would be any faith. But if it, uh, the, one of the real breakdowns in our, our society is a, a belief in God. You know, there's no question that's one of the breakdowns. Because only with a belief in God do you have accountability that you answer to a higher authority. You don't answer it to yourself. And uh, that's one of the great breakdowns, okay? There's no question in my mind. You know, it's a personal responsibility, family, and a belief in God. And that's what made the country great. You know, and I, I simply said, listen, my favorite, favorite quote from the Bible is, what you do for the least of my brothers, you do for me. So and that's what, you know, that's what motivates me. I also like going to church very much. I used to go to church at St. James in Stratford. And, there, and, and I'll tell you why I like to go to church. There used to be a girl there. Uh, her name was Vicky, And, I, you know, I became very friendly with Vicky. We used to fool around all the time, make jokes about people coming in and how they look. You know. We just had a wonderful time. And every, every day at the communion, you know, I, you know, she would leave. She wouldn't stay at the communion. So one day I said, hey, Vicky, I, this was 7.30 Mass. So I say, hey, Vicky, how come you how come you walk out all the time? She says, oh, Bob, I work. I'm a cashier at Stop and Shop. You know, uh, I, you know, I have to be work at eight. Now, for me, it's it was a thrill to have a personal relationship to someone who works at Stop and Shop as a cashier, and you know, and I don't, you couldn't get that experience if you, if you weren't in church with different people. So I think it's a common denominator that I really, I really appreciate and really enjoy. The thing that I appreciate is that 45 minutes, 50 minutes of, of silence. Mm -hmm. It forces you to reflect. Oh, sure. Yeah. The Bridgeport Archdiocese was interested in this podcast, by the way. Okay. <laughs> How do you choose which organizations that you, I support? Yeah. I'm what the Irish call a soft touch. Okay, I try to help everybody, you know, but I try to help organizations where there's no layers, like the Merton House in, in Bridgeport. You know, we feed six, seven hundred people a day. You know, we feed them in the morning and in the afternoon. We feed people who live in cars. Bridgeport Rescue Mission on Park Avenue. You know, I was very helpful in, the, in finding that building for them and helping them with it there. And the job they do down there is stunning. People showing up and taking groceries out every day, you know. It's my duty to help. And you understand? The government cannot do the same job we can do if we want to help other people. And there's no overhead in these organizations. Your money is going right to food to feed people. And that's fantastic. And that's what I try to support that type of... If you talk to people about what makes them reluctant to give, it's usually because they're afraid that money is not going to get. Oh, oh, I, 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 I agree with them 100%. A, a, a lot of these organizations have just too much overhead. But when you go down the Merton House, you go down, you go down and you see people coming in and getting f free food. You go down to Bridgeport Rescue Mission and see people getting, you know, they have rooms for mothers with no, you know, no homes for children. I mean, you kidding me? You know, I, I mean, you know, oof. I mean, there's so many people in this country that are so needy. I think it's important, too, that we understand, and you've done a good job explaining, why organizations like the Rescue Mission mm -hmm. are worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that people will probably be able to see for themselves pretty quickly when they do right. their own research. Um, I covered the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting. Okay. And, you know, we broadcast uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett's comments. And the one recurring theme that they had was, you know, strap in. Things are rough now, but this is a long game. And I thought, how far in the future does Bob Sinto plan? Is it possible to plan? How far in the future can you plan in the business that you do? No, you can't. 
You know, anyone who thinks they can tell you what's going to happen two or three years from now is just smoking pot, all right? You need to stay very focused on what you need to do today and what you need to do tomorrow. And, you know, take one day at a time. I mean, you know, everything changes, so you have to be prepared for the changes. I'll give you a, a cute example. I have a beautiful grandson by the name of Frankie Sinto, okay? He's about six years old, and he's a trip, okay? My wife always picks him up because she likes to spend some time with him, okay? So now uh, she, he's, she's driving home from school, and Frankie goes, Grandma, pull over here, pull over here, right over here. And because my wife says, I'm going to buy you a toy. She goes, why do you want, just pull over here. Take out your phone. Go, open up Amazon. I'm going to tell you the toy I want. Okay, what does that tell you? That tells you the retail business is finished. If a six-year-old kid is telling my wife, pull over to order something on Amazon, okay, there's a different world going on. So, you know, you got to be prepared how you're going to handle that going forward. So being in real estate, I'm, a, I'm attuned to that. That's, you know, things are changing, but just you have to learn to change with it. What other changes are on the horizon? We really need to change the way we look at things around here, okay? This is not going to last forever. There's a lot of mistakes going on in, in, in the big picture that things have to change, okay? People have to get back to a work ethic. They have to, back, they have to get back to work. The thinking that you can just work from home is not possible. You know, one of my tenants says, he know, Bob, you know, uh, he, he pays me maybe $75,000 a year in rent. He rents around 3,000 feet, about 25,000 a foot. He, he has about 10 people to work for. He goes, the other day I saw at 2 o'clock one of my guys picking up his son at lacrosse practice. Okay, instead of being on the phones working customers. For seventy-five grand a year, don't you think I want to watch what ten people are doing? You can't build culture. You, you, a young person coming out of college, they want to step up the ladder. They want to be successful. You can't do that from home. That's not possible. So eventually, corporations are going to have to begin telling people, and that's going to happen, John, as soon as we hit the next recession, depression. Okay, right now you you can't hire people. As soon as the people begin getting laid off, who are you going to lay off? You're going to lay off people you don't see. People who come to work every day, you're not going to lay them off, okay? So this thing's going to change in the next six months or a year, I hope, period. That aggressive a, a Yeah, time I frame. think so. Yes, because things are changing. You know, banks are not lending money now. You know, this inflation is very hurtful to, to poor people. You know, people are picking up ground beef and putting it back down because they can't afford it. The people are making the decisions to fill up the gas tank or buy food. I mean, you, we can't have this. This inflation hurts poor people. It doesn't hurt rich people. It hurts poor people. And it's, it's a horrible thing what the government did. It's a horrible, horrible. What are you hearing from your tenants? My tenants are in decent shape, uh, thank God. You know, I'm lucky I have a lot of medical buildings. So, you know, they're back. And a lot of tenants have reduced the site and the number of square feet they have. You know, I'm being very fortunate in one way is that I, I have three tenants that made up 450,000 square feet, okay? Uh, so that space all came back to me, and I got rid of about 100, 350 of it. So I only have 100 to go. But I was able to now get a lot of small tenants. Like HealthNet was a building that was 150,000 square feet, one tenant, 150,000 square feet, right? Uh, about seven years ago, I lost a tenant. But now that building has 40 tenants, okay? Now with 40 tenants, that's safety. I can't lose 40 tenants. Not only that, but now with 40 tenants, I have tenants that are growing. Some shrink, some grow. You know, I've got over 400 tenants. So within 400 tenants, you have growth that, you know, and, I, and what's wonderful is if a tenant, you know, John, if a tenant rents space, they got five years and two years left, two years to go, or four, three years to go, whatever it may, and he said, Bob, I need another three, 4,000 square feet. I just rip up that lease. I move the tenant. 
So that's what we like to try to get to. You must have read my notes. Internal growth was a concept that you talked about last time. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Well, that's, you know, I called my first wife theory. I, I don't know if I mentioned that or not. But the whole secret of the, my first Say wife. Say that again. You, you call I called it my first wife theory. If I can hang on to my first wife and hang on to my first tenant, I'm going to be in very good financial condition. Okay? Now, how do you hang on to people? How do you hang on to a wife? Number one, you got to be very grateful. I mean, my wife will tell you that I always open the door for her to get into the car. And I always thank her when she feed, when I have supper. I always thank her for supper, okay? I'm grateful. The mistake that most people have in business and in life is they take people and things for granted, okay? That's the big mistake, is that they have a tenant and they don't think they have to you know, worry about the tenant. They take them for granted. And that's the great mistake in life, okay? Don't take relationships for granted. You know, you hire, you work your guts off to hire someone to come to work for you, and then you walk by them in the hallway, and you don't even say good morning because you've taken that to, for granted. And, you know, and, and when you take things for granted, it destroys happiness. When you expect things, it destroys happiness, okay? In other words... If I if I have if I have a child, Robert, uh, um, and, uh, I don't know, any of my kids, if I expect them to call me, and they call me, I'm not happy because I expected them to call, and if they don't call, I am not happy, okay, because I expected them to call. So when you expect things, you destroy happiness. All right, and you know, like your greatest gift that you have is your health. You take it for granted. You know, you have to really be conscious of your health, what you eat, you know, how well you're sleeping. I, I, you know, I work my guts off, but I work out six days a week. You know, you ever been on a plane coming back from Italy and the plane lands and everyone claps? You know why they clap? They didn't expect to land, okay? They're happy. <laughs> that's why these people are happy, okay? So that's an example. Hey, I was on a flight one time that had a false landing. Okay. We were in Greece, yeah. and the plane went down and then aborted the landing. So you want to talk about clapping. Um, you listed your five Fs of success. Yes. Can you walk us through? You want me to name them? No, and then you I, walk? I, no I can't. You know them? Do you know them? Of course I know them. <laughs> Funny story. There's a guy named Philip. I forgot the guy's the last name. I, I, I can't say it. I, 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 he was the president of People's Bank at the time. Never spent any time with him. My first time with him, and we're driving around. So he says to me, Bob, it looks like you're having a lot of fun. I said, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun, Philip. Um, I said, do uh, uh, you know the five Fs of business? So Philip goes, no, no, I don't know the five Fs. What are the five Fs of business? So I said, what did they teach you at the London School of Economics, okay? Uh, so I said, basically, you got to have fun. you got to be friendly. You got to be fast, you got to be focused, and you got to be flexible. Especially fast and flexible. You got to move the ball quickly. You know, I say yes, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that, okay, that's okay. You know, because I want to move the transaction. I've got the big picture. The big picture is getting you into the space. You know, what I have to do to get you there is immaterial to me. Okay, so you have to be flexible. And those are the five F's. When you talk about being fast, that makes me wonder, what is a time frame where you start to realize this may not work out and you got to move on? In when, what when, when you're courting a, a potential tenant. Oh, well, you know, you, you know, I mean, you know, when you lose a deal, you have to be gracious. You know, one time uh, a country home baker, I think is the name of the tenant, I lost a deal and I wrote the, the lady a letter and say, so, listen, I really uh, miss having you as a tenant, but I think I probably miss more uh, uh, knowing you better. All right? Five years later, she told them to find, uh, they, 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 to get out of the space they moved into, and she said, make sure you go see Bob. So even when you lose a transaction, you thank them for their time. You thank them for considering it. And, if, uh, and I always tell people, if I can help you, when, if, if you have any questions about the lease or anything, I'll be honest with you. I'll be happy to help you. 
You know, those are the things that people don't do. They lose, so now they're pissed off. No. If you're going to lose, you know, leave, make them think maybe I should have gone to Sinto. You know, but this would not have happened. So that it's a good advice. You know, good advice. Do you get a lot of people through referrals? Well, most of our business is through brokers, you know, and about 30% of our business is internal growth. But, you know, brokers, that's, you know, they're out in the marketplace. They're with people. And you got to understand something, John. A lot of these major tenants won't come out without a broker because they don't want to be criticized for not seeing the market. Okay, with a broker, they got to see everything, right? Okay, then I was just looking at my product. And we normally get the transactions because we have the, we may not be the cheapest, but the, we're the best value. All right? But you get more for us, you know, than anything. A guy down the street said, he came up to me, he goes, Bob, he goes, I need to move out of that building. I had a client that went to the bathroom. There was no toilet paper in the john. Okay? Seems, I, I mean, it, right. But that's- All right. So, you know, so... When you, you know, I'm lucky because a lot of these buildings in my marketplace are owned by institutions because they had to take them back. So they're not, there's not a lot of private ownership, so you don't, have, you don't have any real competition. How do you plan where the next project's going to be? I've seen, you're, you're moving around. I'm, I'm seeing your name in, in, new, in exciting places. Well, I, I think we, we need to find the land. And that's the problem. I think in in the near future we're going to begin buying buildings and knocking them down because we're running out of land. And uh, Shelton has very few pieces left that's zoned, you know. That, but you know, I always tell people money is like water and air. What you can't drink, you can't breathe, you can't really use. All right? I want to run a good operation. I want to take care of my people who've been with me a long time. And I want to be very profitable, okay? I don't need to go and do 9 million deals all over the country. That's not my nature. So I stay focused in two or three towns, and I've done very well. What are those towns? Oh, Fairfield, uh, Shelton, and Trumbull, mainly. The next couple of years, I think, will be very telling. And as you said, we are running out of space here. Um I think that became very apparent during COVID when Mm -hmm. there was this exodus out of New York up to here. How did you weather that? I mean, obviously, we didn't see that coming. We, you know, we had two years that we didn't give out any bonuses and out any raises, and everyone understood that. This past year, we gave uh, very large raises to most of our people because of inflation. Okay. Most of my tenants are more tenants, so that, you know, we've been just very lucky. We've had very good tenants, and we haven't had a real problem. See, most of the people who live in New York, you understand, are ending up in Greenwich and Stanford. So that's more of an impact there. The advantage we're getting is we're, the Mirror Parkway and the Turnpike, you can't move on in the morning. It's not possible. So, so we, you know, we can save you two hours a day, to three hours a day of your life if you rent space for me, all right? So that's what we've done well. And I like to tell people, in the New York situation is a double-edged sword in, in the sense that everyone wants to leave the city and is really helping Connecticut, okay, tremendously. But if New York is not a great city, there's no reason to have Fairfield County, Okay, so short term we're getting the benefit, but long term it might be disastrous. I mean, we can end up being like another San Francisco. I say every week that if I get to half the points that you right. know I want to talk with you about, that's a miracle. We have a lot to cover in our next meeting, but can you leave us with another required reading? Okay. Well, now, now we have we're compiling like a library. The Bob Sinto library. Well, there's only here. three books. Okay, so this ain't going. Low, there's only three books. Then I, give us our third. Well, the third is then. Then of course is the Road Less Travel. It's my favorite book. There we go. And why? Uh, why? Because the first three letters, first three three words of the book sold you know eight million copies. First three letters, first sentence. Life is difficult. 
And the secret to your life is your ability to solve problems. That's the secret. And the book gives you four tools to solve any problem. If you have those four tools, you can solve any problem. Okay? And like when I come in the morning, in the, I always say the first thing I say to everyone, anyone, anyone has any problems here? Because that's my job. I, I have to solve problems. If you have the, if you have the attitude that you want problems, because that was what makes you a better person, to solve them. Now, basically, you have to deal in the truth, okay? Delay gratification is very important. And you know what it means. The delay, if you were in school, you came home. If you did your homework right away, you could enjoy the rest of the night. If you didn't do the homework right away, it's, not, it's on your mind, you're not enjoying the night. Well, that's what a relationship. If you have somebody, okay, that uh, you're not doing, getting along with, if you don't get it out, so let's talk about this, you can't enjoy the rest of the relationship. So the other thing is balance. You got to always balance your life. It's okay to tell a white lie, okay? A white lie is a lie that doesn't advance your agenda. It event, it helps someone else. In other words, I can tell you, John, you look good today, okay? Nice. My hair looks That's okay. a little bit of a white lie, John, okay? <laughs> but that makes you feel good. So in other words, if you and your wife are thinking of getting a divorce, you're not going to tell your kids you're thinking of getting a divorce because it might not happen, okay? So you, don't, you need to balance things, okay? And the last one is responsibility. Those are the four disciplines. You have to know what you're responsible for. I am not responsible for what's happening in Washington, okay? It's beyond my... I'm not. I am responsible for what's happening in these walls. I am responsible for my children. I'm responsible for my tenants, for the people who work for me. So stay focused on your personal responsibility. Uh, but the other great thing about the book is it tells you about your relationship to God and what love is and what love isn't. You know, um, I once gave a lecture... Uh, I was I was voted Entrepreneur of the Year maybe 15, 20 years ago. I went down to New York City, and uh, about fifteen hundred people in in the room, uh, in the hotel. And I I always give my same speech about you know graduated from high school, you know I, I didn't know the difference between a noun and a verb. I remember I saying to my father, "What does the N mean in in the dictionary? You know it means N, a noun." I didn't know that. My father thought I was kidding me. Okay. So this one girl, real estate broker, I always open it up for questions. So I call it on this order. And she says to me, uh, really wise-ass question, okay? She says, uh, when did you learn the difference between a noun and a verb? That's the question. So I said to her, I said, miss, I said, have, do we know each other? Have we ever met each other? She goes, no. I said, okay. All right, I'm going to ask you, the word love. Is it a noun, meaning a feeling? Or is it a verb, meaning an action word? What is it? So she says, it's a noun. So I said, well, I said, ma'am, I said, I don't know you from Adam, but I can t guarantee you one thing. You do not have a, a very effective or meaningful love life. You ask a mother with three kids what love is. If it's an action. It's an action word. You go out and love somebody. Well, all that knowledge comes from the road less travel. Because that also tells you about your ego, about how you think about people, okay? It's, it tells you the psychological, what you're responsible for. It's a phenomenal book, you know? And, and you know, there's a book called Don't Sweat the Smart Stuff, which is it's a little combination of those two other books written in another way. One last, one last quick story. When I was studying the, the seven habits, I used to keep the book in my, my jacket when I was skiing so that on the ski lift, the seven, eight minutes on the lift, I would study the book, you understand? So I didn't waste seven, eight minutes. So one time I was on, I got, I, I was on a, uh, with a gentleman, and uh, one of the things is said, begin with the end in mind. That's from the seven habits. Begin? Begin with the end in mind. And what does that mean? Okay. What it means is that, you know, you got to have a mission where you want to get to. 
In other words, what is said in the book is pretend that you're going to a funeral. And as you walk into the funeral, into the casket, as you're walking down, you look to your right and to the left, and you see people that you know that knew the person who passed away. And you get down, you kneel down to show your respect, and you look into the coffin. Who do you see? You see yourself. Now you're going to sit down and four people are going to talk about you. A religious person, a family member, a friend, and a business associate. What are they going to say about you? And you have to write it out, what they're going to say about you. That's the end. What a great exercise. Right? Humbling. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But what a great way of understanding. So I told the guy, I, see, the way you, way I, I did so well reading, I, after I read something, I try to teach it to the next person I see so that if you can verbalize what you read. So the guy says to me, what if you, what if you don't care what they say about you? So I said to him, I said, sir, do you have any children? He goes, yes. I said, do they talk to you? And as soon as I said that, he looked straight ahead, and he didn't say another word, okay? I hit a nerve, okay? Those are the three books I tell people to read. I love that we end each episode like this, and you touched upon something I want to discuss in the next episode, and that is that, that use of time. Yeah, it's very important. What I want to do with this program, okay, is to, is to tell people the, some of the tools and some of the things I've learned to be successful that they may be able to learn, okay? That's what I want to do. I mean, I'm here to try to help as many people as I can from both sides of the aisle, period. So next time we get together, time use, tools, trends. Yeah, whatever you want to talk about, I'll, I'll talk about. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you. <laughs>